Hey, Uncle Mark. Uh, yeah. You know who sucks? Uh, it's like, hold on, let me open the, the spreadsheet. Uh, who are we adding? The answer is us. We oh, all suck so well, that was, bad. That's a given. Yeah. Who's got and, uh, six thumbs and sucks real hard? <laughs> <laughs> These guys. Yeah. Uh, but uh, of us, I think one of us sucks uh, the most, at least for right now. Well, I'll let you two fight that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uncle, Uncle Doug, uh, I understand you, you have some, uh, some unsucking to do. Let's, I got some work to do. Let's, let, <laughs> us, let us uh, bask in the glow of the derp that is mine. Um, yeah. Well, dear uncles, I know that our listeners tune into the show to hear their infallible audio uncles dispense pearls of wisdom from high atop our ivory towers. But yeah. I think after 151 episodes, it's time we let our listeners in on a little secret. We don't live in a tower. So, moving on. I live in oh, a townhouse. I you mean, t- yeah, two of us live in townhouses. <laughs> That's so right. I yeah. feel like maybe, I don't know. I All think right. Doug is having third story envy. <laughs> <laughs> but go on. All right, from our ivory townhouses. <laughs> but from time to time, your uncles make mistakes. <clears throat> it's just yeah. a fact of the matter. Whether it's Uncle Mark claiming that he never beat me up as a kid, or <laughs> Uncle Dan claiming that he didn't enjoy dressing in drag. No, I said I never didn't beat you up as a kid. <laughs> And I must admit that from time to time, even your Uncle Doug can get things wrong. <clears throat> Such was the case in a couple of my, last, my most recent segments, or recent segments, from earlier this year. And uh, so today, in our version of Stump the Chump, for any Car Talk listeners out there, I'm going to swallow my pride, man up, and face the music by desperately trying to justify my mistakes. So, <laughs> here we go. Now... I have uh, said loudly and often that if I get a fact wrong, mispronounce a name or other some such error, that instead of writing to correct me, I would appreciate if everyone went to Wikipedia and changed the facts to match my statements. However, it <laughs> like appears you do. That you, that's what you're supposed to do. They did it after Sarah Palin uh, made up her own Paul Revere story. That's right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ringing them bells and shooting them yeah. guns. Yeah. Um, now, uh, it appears that two listeners did not get the message and sent me lists of what I did wrong. So <laughs> let's look into these two uh, possible areas of mistakes. The first of these was in reference to my segment on the Shroud of Turin back in episode 132. Listener Andrea Nicolo- Nicolodi wrote me a list of seven corrections to which I just have to ask Andrea Nicolodi, who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah, who the <laughs> fuck do you think you are? What, what are you, some How kind of expert you? in the field? Did you literally write the book on the Shroud of Turin? Well, I got a little less petulant when I saw where Andrea Nicolodi was writing from, one Turin, Italy. It turns, yes. out, it turns out that Andrea Nicolodi is professor of history of Christianity and churches, Andrea Nicolodi, at the University of Turin. Yes. Whose specialty is the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> He's not only one of the world's preeminent scholars on the Shroud, but has quite literally written the book on the Shroud of Turin. I am <laughs> and, holding it right now. And wasn't, uh-huh. he, wasn't he called, uh, isn't he called the greatest enemy of the Shroud? Yeah, he's, he's this, this, this I, where did you read that? Where did Someone I read there, that? yeah, we were bouncing back and forth when he, yeah, when he first he, wrote to in us. In his emails, he said, I'm actually called the, the biggest enemy. of." And, and he said he can, when he opens his window, he can hear the bells of the church. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, fuck which, you, expert. So, which, Uncle Doug, that, you know that makes you enemy second? number two. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, yeah, he's ri- literally, I have the book in hand now, uh, and one of the reasons it's taken me so long to, to issue these corrections is that I wanted to get and read the book before doing so. Uh, he, he, it's only recently published and then only recently translated into English. Um, Professor Nicolodi, by the way, speaks English quite well, um, but obviously for a work of scholarly, you know, import like this, it requires quite a heavy-duty translation. So yeah, um, and then it loses all the poetry. I, it's very <laughs> sad. Yeah. So the book I itself, read it, I read it in the, in the original Italian. I didn't <laughs> understand any of it, but I read it. I read it in Arabic, <laughs> which is Why weird because I can't read or speak Arabic. So <laughs> right. I found it kind of a dull read. Well, the book itself, the Shroud of Turin: the history and Le- the history and legends of the world's most famous relic is a nearly 500-page, heavily footnoted history of this strange object. Oh my God, 500 and it's, pages. 500, and it's actually a great read. There is huh. so much more to the story, uh, and, and in a lot of ways it reads like a Dan Brown novel, except, hmm. you know, good. 
Um, <laughs> so I definitely recommend it. Uh, and, and I told uh, Professor Nicolodi that I would give him a shout out for the, him in the book. So there you go. Um, but I'll, let's, I'll tell you what, because I read those emails too, Doug. Yeah. He was incredibly nice about it. Oh, he's such a sweetheart. It's such a sweetheart. And he said, you know what? It was a super entertaining a uh, bit, and I I enjoyed listening to it. I just happened to know you got a few things wrong because <laughs> this is my life's work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was cool. It was cute. Uh, it sounds like he has a Google alert for anything that mentions the Shroud of Turin, which is probably how he found our show. Well, it's how how we found the show. Yeah, I think he, he was a fan from the beginning. <laughs> he was so gracious, and and we corresponded back and forth a couple times. And this was back when Italy was in the full throes of the coronavirus in April. Remember yeah. those halcyon days. Yeah. So remember when Italy was the stupid country? Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. Exactly. So let's look at Professor Nicolodi's seven corrections and see if this is all as bad as it sounds. So first, in the segment I talked about the risen Jesus wrapped up like a mummy stumbling around his tomb, the professor points out that the words strips, as in strips of, uh, of cloth, and mummy do not appear in the Bible. That's mm-hmm. true. And that the Greek, Greek word for which is translated as othonia, which has several meanings but is most commonly translated as linens. Mm. Point taken, but in my defense, this, sh- this show is supposed to be funny, believe it or not. <laughs> so l- liberties will occasionally be taken to that end, and this was certainly the case here. How dare you take a liberty with the Shroud of Turin? <laughs> I'm just surprised to know that we were supposed to be funny this whole time. I know. <laughs> well, it's, never t- it's never too late. Feels like um, the pressure's on. I, I think it's too late. I so I'm going to dodge that first one a little bit. But second, the professor points out that the face covering, uh, or as the King James Version puts it, uh, the napkin uh, <laughs> and Jesus' clothes were in separate corners and not, as I said, uh, not, sorry, not as I said in separate corners of the tomb, but, li- but only lying separately. Fair enough. But I think, again, I can hide behind uh, exaggeration here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Third, I claim that the historical attestation of the, the first historical attestation, attestation of the shroud was in a letter to the Pope in 1390. It turns out the letter was written in 1389. So, yeah, oh, good. <laughs> got that one wrong. <laughs> we're getting we're getting pretty hardcore with the uh, with the corrections here. Yeah, yeah. It was actually a Tuesday, and Doug said a Wednesday. So. <laughs> no. <Yeah. clears throat> However, it turns out that the shroud was known about in the region uh, as early as 1355. I could not find this fact in any of my sources, but I did learn it from reading a certain book. So fifth, no, fourth, pardon me. Uh, I claim that the shroud remained in the house of Charney until 1543, but the date was actually 1453. Oops. Oh, there you oh go. my God. I checked my notes. I had it correct in my notes. I just read it wrong on air. You got me, professor. If you guys, if, listen, if you all want to withdraw your patronage, we'll just pull the plug <laughs> on this thing. That sort of error. When reporting on a garbage fraud is just not acceptable it's just yeah it's yeah. and and it's beneath us it's, yeah. <laughs> so fifth i it's claim actually that, wrapped around us <laughs> exactly uh in the fifth, corner i claim that poor claire nun the poor claire nuns repaired the shroud in 1694 the year was actually 1534 yeah that's a bad one that's a big old that's a big old cock up in my defense 160 years in the whole history of the universe is just a rounding error so See? it's not that big a deal so right? what's crazy is I went back and checked my source for that, and it was 1534, so I just straight up cocked that one up. Yeah. Uh, sixth, at the end of my segment, I stated that the shroud is in the cathedral built in 1668 by Guarino Gorini, when it actually has been in the chapel of the Cathedral of Turin, where it's been for the last 30 years. So that is true, but um, in my defense, uh, I, I did, and in order not to bore our listeners, I left a little bit on the editing room floor, and that little fact was one of them. Mm-hmm. That it, the Shroud of Turin was in a particular building in Turin and not in this other building in Turin. But point taken. I mean, Jesus, Professor, my, my segment was six pages at 14, po- 14 point font. Your book is nearly 500 pages. I'm going to leave some stuff out. <laughs> um, if we're going to go over a list of everything you've got wrong, I don't know that we have enough. Yeah. Um, I tape feel like on the we're real, gonna real here. Maybe we should do another a, a totally other podcast that's just <laughs> shit that follows <laughs> immediately on this podcast. <laughs> it's twice as long. Yeah. All right. Seventh and lastly, sindon does not mean sheet in Italian, as I stated, uh, but it is a Greek word meaning shroud or cloth. This one mm. is a wee bit embarrassing, as all one has to do to, to clear this up is put sindon into Google, and all that pops right up. So yeah. that was dumb. Um, but I got to say, 
uh, for being taken to the woodshed by the literal professor of the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, yeah. by the standards of my academic history and this show, <laughs> I feel like I'm in A-plus territory right now. <laughs> fully. Fully. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, I don't know if the professor is still uh, a listener of the show. I would imagine that given the fact that the first episode he listened to was me stomping all over his life's work like a drunken recent div- divorcee, he may have given up on us. But if you are listening, professor, I'm sorry, okay? So. I believe I believe the Italian word you're looking for is mea culpa. Mea culpa. Um, so uh, the second set of corrections. <clears throat> yeah, we're not done. Comes from a longtime listener. We'll call D. I, I emailed him earlier today to see if I could use his name. I haven't heard back, so let's assume that we can't. Uh, he had some corrections and clarifications to which. Uh, oh, it was it was uh, back. Oh, I forgot to mention we actually met this uh, this listener. I, I think the, you're okay to mention his name. He's, you think? Yeah. Okay. Now I got to yeah. pull it up. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. No, but you go ahead. You go uh, ahead. Um, like I, I cleaned it out of my my. Um, notes so I wouldn't fine. accidentally blurt it out. Yeah. <laughs> so we met him at the uh, Ark Encounter or when, at breakfast before we went to the Ark Encounter in Cincinnati, by the way. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, the American Atheist. So back in episode 140, I talked about Haitian voodoo and listener D wrote in with some corrections and clarifications to which I got to ask, who the fuck do you think you are? What? Are you some kind of expert in this field? Have you worked with Haitians for over 25 years? Are you fluent in Creole? I should really start reading the whole email before shifting into petulant question mode. <laughs> it turns out that D is all of those things. So, great. Here we go yeah. again. Yeah. So, we'll save my biggest one for the last, shall we? Yeah. Uh, D first calls out my pronunciation, which I believe I have made very clear is going to be terrible. <laughs> in the kindest way possible, D states that in all his years of traveling to Haiti, he has never heard anyone mispronounce the word for spirits as badly as me. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I kept pronouncing it Iwa when it's actually Lua. Oh. Um, it appears that I kept reading the the the, uh, the L as a capital I. So, oh, boof. Okay. yeah, that's bad. Um, D also wanted to expand on why voodoo was able to thrive in slave colonies across the Caribbean. This was due to the malleability of voodoo, and that as slave owners tried to impose their religion onto the slaves, they simply took Catholicism and just layered it into their own native beliefs. We did touch on that, but it's certainly a point mm-hmm. worth reiterating, so fair enough. Mm-hmm. D also clarifies some stuff about Papa Doc Devoyer. I mistakenly downplayed Papa Doc's devotion to voodoo. After having a heart attack and not breathing for several minutes, it turns out that Papa Doc went in big for voodoo mm-hmm. as he descended into paranoia and delusion. In fact, Papa Doc created his secret police unit, the Tonton Makut, uh, mm-hmm. after a voodoo legend of a boogeyman that would come and take you away in a bag. Tauntaun actually means uncle, and Makut is a bag you throw over your shoulder. This seems like the perfect place to make an uncle joke, but I find it's never prudent to make a joke whose punchline is a murderous paramilitary. Mm. But do do go to the Heretique to find your Tauntaun Makut, whatever uh, 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 items. Tauntaun ton, ton Makut tote. You're calling yeah, your exactly. Tauntaun Matote. Your, your toot toot Matote. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I mentioned that voodoo dolls were nothing more than kitsch for tourists, and D corrects me that in all his travels to Haiti, he has never even seen one in a gift shop. So apparently, oh, wow. even as trinkets, it's more of a New Orleans thing than a Haitian one, so fair enough. Uh, I talked br- briefly about Wade Davis and his research into tetrodotoxin, de- tetro which I described as, quote, widely discredited. D took exception with that and claims that the conclusions of his research are more nuanced than that. D, I'm going to defer to you on that one, brother. Uh, we did talk about the myth of uh, about Haitian zombies and how they are not real. Well, it's a wee bit more complicated than that. My point was that in the context of the many misconceptions about Haitian voodoo was the one about undead, dom- uh, undead zombies, which is not true. However, there is a phenomenon in Haitian voodoo where through drugging and psychological torture, one can become almost literally a mindless slave to a master. These are not undead, and they uh, have been uh, can and have been rescued and rehabilitated in the in the past, but not without lasting damage, as you might imagine. So, so this, you're telling us zombies are real? That's well, what you're saying to the, us right now. Z- zombies, the way we think about them in the George Romero sense, are not real. But these are. But but so when when we did this, when you did this piece, Doug, I'd read a little bit about uh, actual Haitian zombies, and I yeah. didn't. I 
didn't say anything because I figured you'd done more research than I have. Of course, that has turned out not to be true. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a thing where where through some poisoning and a series of highly engineered traumatic experiences, yep. they fuck these people up so much that they basically can just make them slaves for the rest of their lives. Yeah, and I that and I sounds fun. I yeah. read up on that, but I, you know, my the tenor of my segment was more about the misconceptions of voodoo. Right. So I, you know, there, there is when when you say zombie. We in the West or whatever have a certain perception of what that is. Yeah. So that's not what this is exactly, but it's not not that. <laughs> so that yeah. That's that is what it is, and so uh, uh, these these kinds of zombies are real, and D has even met one. Mm. Um, so yeah, crazy, huh? So fair enough. I left that part of it out. I don't. Oh, I don't hope I didn't get it totally wrong, but I definitely left it out. Um, lastly, D was surprised by my claim that there were, there could be up to 40 million practitioners of voodoo. Now I did pull that number from a source, a single source, but I was perhaps a bit too credulous. It's also probably not a knowable number because most Haitians living abroad are members of other religions and would probably answer the question with that first. Mm. Okay. So there are between nine and 11 million Haitians in Haiti. The vast majority practice voodoo. And while there are significant Haitian populations in the U S the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Chile, and Canada, the total number of voodoo practitioners worldwide is surely far less than what I said. So, mm. yeah, that was bad. So, Boy, you really cocked that one up, Doug. I did. So there you go. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I own my mistakes I, w- when I have to and blame them on others when I can. So I also, <laughs> you know, listen, I want to be called out. If, if, if you know, um, pe- if I make mistakes, I should be called out. And Professor Nicolodi and D. We're massive good sports about this. So heretics, listen up. Absolutely send in feedback about whatever subjects we cover that you are either a professor of or have at least 25 years experience in. So <laughs> that I'm happy to take feedback from the professional class. Well, I, I would take a slightly different tack when I say I would just ask anybody who has any professional experience or training in anything not to listen to the show. Yes. And I think that way. Right. That's our inbox will be will be much much less cluttered. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, and, and and both you guys were awesome sports, and yeah, I I cocked it up a bit. So thank you for the feedback, and I think the record has now been set straight that I am somewhat unintelligent. Yes. Well, <laughs> in, in our defense, I would say, look, we're three guys who are not other than kind of the Mormon sphere. We're not really experts on any of this stuff, <clears throat> but we, uh, you know, it's a hobby, and we can be bothered by religion in our free time. And that's yeah. kind of what we do. So we we strive for a hundred percent. We hit fifty. We're doing pretty good. That's right. <laughs> that's right. right. And it, and if we allow Doug to continue being on the show, please feel free to write in and tell him uh, any of your issues with anything that he's done. Yeah. Or or or, or, or vote me off the island. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Well, Doug, good job. I guess. Um, <laughs> or try to do a good job. I guess would be what I'd say. So. Uh, thanks for thanks for uh, 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 an airing of grievances against yourself. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Happy Festivus, everybody. <laughs> Moving on. Ooh.